as well. And uh, we're in a series of talks right now called Sidekicks. Um, so fun fact, there are different ways you can study the Bible, ways you can study Scripture. Um, sometimes we do it um, where we look at a book of the Bible. Um, other times we may study a particular topic and then we'll look at what the Bible says in different areas about that topic. And then there's one of my favorite ways to study Scripture, which is through character study. Um, where you zoom in on the life of someone that we meet in Scripture, these people who, who walked the earth and, and, and lived in historical times. And, and then we learn, like, from their life things we can ap- apply um, to our walk with Jesus. So um, it's Mother's Day. So, again, we're going to talk and, and give a big shout-out to all of our moms. Um, but this series, the, the reason why we call it Sidekicks is because sometimes, I don't know if, if you have the same problem. Maybe you never read the Bible. It's a cool book. Um, it's funny that we, that we tell everybody to read it because I'm like, I grew up in church. Um, I went to like, you know, Bible study and like um, Sunday school and all that kind of stuff. And one of the first people who is larger than life that you meet as a kid in church is Noah. And, and there's this cool picture of these animals and like two by two and the rainbow. And it's like, man, God is awesome. And then you're like, wait, he killed everybody on the planet with a flood? Like, it's some of that stuff where you're like, whoa, what a story. And that's one of the ones we introduce to kids. And then sometimes you meet characters like Jesus, who is God. So that's why we worship him. You meet Samson, who does these amazing feats of strength. And then you meet some amazing ladies who are crushing it. You're Deborah, who is a, a judge of all Israel. You meet Esther and Ruth, and they got books in the Bible named after them. So it's just amazing seeing these folks. But sometimes I just don't connect because um, I'm not making those kind of moves in my life. So it's nice to zoom in on some people who aren't that large. But again, it's, it's Mother's Day. So I, I have to show you like the greatest hero, maybe up for debate. Um, none other than Chuck Norris. So if we can throw Chuck up on the screen, my goodness, what, what a guy. Now, now, here's a fun fact that you may not know is, is related to Mother's Day. Um, when Chuck Norris was born, he actually drove his mom home from the hospital. So just a great son, loving his mom, doing what he can. Um, I, now, I snitched on my mom in, in the 930 service, so I'm going to tell you all the same thing. Um, y'all can blame her for this. Um, <laughs> so when I was a kid, there was a program on the television um, before we could, like, stream stuff called Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah. Shout, okay, so, we, we got, so my mom, she came to, to service today wearing cowboy boots. Like, it was wild. And um, so I grew up with this fear. Like, I think I'm a little scarred. I might go get some, some calcium for this because all I knew is that Walker, Texas Ranger, I mean, the, the eyes of the Ranger, they're upon you. And like any wrong you do, he's going to see. And so when you're in Texas, you should look behind you because that's, that's where the Ranger's going to be. So I get nervous up here preaching knowing that Chuck Norris is watching me, but I'll try to do him some justice. Chuck Norris, check this out. He once won a game of Connect Four with three moves. Only Chuck Norris can pull off such a feat. And his calendar, the calendar for Chuck Norris goes straight from March 31st to April 2nd. Because nobody makes a fool of Chuck Norris. And again, like, I, I got to shout out my, kid, my kids. So, man of kids, like, share this with the kids at some point this week. Um, Chuck Norris once roundhouse kicked a horse in the chin. His descendants are what we call giraffes. So again, like if you just need to explain where some of God's amazing creatures came from, that's probably a bad way (laughs) to do it. So anywho, for this series of sidekicks, uh, we we decided to examine the lives of five ladies, and they're all named Mary. Um, So no, this series isn't about women. Like There there are things that we can all learn from these women. So we're going to look at their lives. And the Mary that I want us to look at today, she's she's low-key pretty famous, Um, and, and And y'all know her. I mean, it's Mother's Day, so of course we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I want to examine a different story in her life, Um, a moment where she played the sidekick role, uh, where she she was behind the scenes and and simply did something practical in order to release someone into their destiny. Um, But just to kind of frame you with Mary, um, I, I think there are some attributes that we see in her life that are super amazing. I don't want us to speed past those. Because what we see demonstrated in the life of Mary is the courage of a mother being willing to sacrifice for their child. So again, shout out to all the moms. Um, I know every story is different, um, and I know like there's some political rhetoric and things going on in our country. But um, yeah, my mom chose me. Um, she she didn't have to, and um, I, I'm grateful. Um, so again, just grateful for all you moms who who make that sacrifice um, for the life and and the well being of your children. Uh, So let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 28 through 38 in the ESV. 
And, and again, I, w- I want to bring your mind, wrap your mind around the sacrifice made by Mary. The, the verse says in verse 28, and he, this is an angel, an angel came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And I think, like, this is going to help a lot of us out. Um, because sometimes when you hear, like, hey, you're favored by God, like, who doesn't want that? But Mary's smart enough to be like, hold on, <laughs> pause, um, because every calling has a cost. Um, in order for you to actually walk into the purpose that God made you for, um, there, there's going to be some things that have to be laid down. There's some, some dreams, maybe some personal desires that aren't from God. They might be from you, your flesh, um, that we might have to die to. And it could be good things. They're not bad things. They're just not the things that God set you apart for. So Mary was greatly troubled, and she wanted to discern this. Verse 30, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And, his, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since, since I'm a virgin? See, context here, Mary is engaged. So she got a fiancé. His name is Joseph. And, um, you know, you don't have sex before you get married. So she's like... Lord, how are you going to do this? And oh, by the way, if I'm found with child before my wedding, like everybody going to know that you can't really hide a baby after a certain point, right? Like, so, so Mary is, is asking this question to this angel because she realizes that in order to step into this, she's going to have to lose her status. That, that this comes with great peril for Mary. This is the end of all of her dreams. Certainly, her betrothed, I mean, this is a conversation like, hey, honey, so I'm pregnant and God did it. I'm just saying, like, have that conversation with Joseph if you're married. This could potentially cost her her life. Remember, we're talking about Judaism. We're talking about a, a, a people who it's very common to put to death someone found in adultery. And she is certain to bear unspeakable shame. And not only that, she's going to bring the same disgrace on her family. See, we're, we're, we're so used to the, the individual here in America. Like, that, that's, that's why we're the selfie culture where everything's about me and I'm the center of the universe. But in this Eastern culture, it's about the unit. It's about the family. So if Mary were to introduce herself to you, um, she would list all of her ancestry. Um, she would mention her dad. And if she were a mom, she would actually mention her sons before she actually got to her name. So for her to embrace this calling, she would have to embrace this lifelong disgrace. How does she respond? Let's look at verse 35. And the angel answered her, how is this going to happen? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And again, this is what I'm preaching today, but I just feel like y'all need to know it. Like, a barren womb is a dead womb. Like, there, it doesn't produce life. And I think some of y'all just need to be encouraged that there is nothing impossible for our God. That there may be a, a relationship in your life that you think that thing is dead, or there may be a financial situation, or maybe something physical with your body where you're like, God, there is dead. What can you do with this? We serve a God, and there is nothing too hard for him. And so our God, our, our, our job is to simply trust him and to invite him into those spaces in our life. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I I love that language from Mary. Let it be to me according to your word. That's saying, like, God, I know I had some passion. I know I had some dreams. But um, your will, not my will. We see Jesus display that same character. The the, the place of, like, maybe my, my preferences, maybe the things that I thought my life was supposed to play out, like, that's not important anymore. And this is the courage of a mom. And I love that this, this heart of a mom, it really comes from the grace of God. That what we're seeing modeled in Mary is a grace that God offers to each and every one of us. A place where we can step into his plan and a courage to celebrate what he's doing in our lives. So not only does Mary show us the, the courage and the willingness to sacrifice 
her life and her preferences for her child, but she also shows us the faithfulness of a mom. See, I want us to go to the point where Jesus is, is in his crucifixion, the Passion Week, where Jesus is going to the cross, and in the setting where many of his friends and his closest followers would scatter Mary, watches her son embrace the suffering. In fact, let's go to John chapter 19, verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. So picture Mary in this moment where all your hopes and dreams seem like they're over. Um, the, wor- the world's falling apart. Like maybe you remember the moment the angel shared with you and said that you were going to conceive the Son of God and he's going to be on this throne forever. And you're like, this doesn't look like he's going to be on the throne forever. Like, what, what, what are they doing to my son? What are they doing to my baby? Why do I have to watch my child go through this? When it seemed like all the promises had come to naught, Mary is still standing by. She won't shrink away. She wouldn't give up. She would see this thing out to the end, and I absolutely love that faithfulness. See, this is the faithfulness of a mom. Like, I, I don't know anyone other than a mom who can stand by a sickbed of a child. Or maybe on the other end of a telephone accepting a collect call or, or maybe looking through a window at a child who may be in prison. A, a mom will stand through that. It doesn't matter. Like a, a mom has this heart. It's a heart of faithfulness. And hear me because I don't want you to think this is exclusive to women. This is a heart of faithfulness that comes from God. And so as we examine Mary's life, we can learn to stand by, to be available for the people in our lives when they are going through the worst. But that's not the story. Um, I know that's kind of heavy. That's not the story. That, that's kind of Mary like being the, the, the hero of the story. I want to zoom to a different setting. Um, it's still in John's gospel where we actually see Mary in the support role, being the sidekick, because that's the theme of this series. Like ordinary people do amazing things, catalytic things that have eternal reward. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump to a different place in Mary's narrative. And what you're going to see here um, is funny because it's a funny story uh, because Mary looks like a, like just that picture of a classic mom where she's like demanding, like clean your room, like that kind of thing, right? Um, and, and that's actually the subtitle for this message. Um, we're going to see Mary demand. She's going to be demanding, but she's also going to let it go. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that we can all apply to our lives, whether you're leading someone or you're in a relationship with someone. You want to demand, you want to exhort, you want to call out the greatness and hold people accountable to a standard. At the same time, you can't make them do it. Uh, you, can't, you can't force things. So there's a healthy place of letting it go, like Elsa. Um, so again, my, my, my wife's not here, um, but, but I mean, I got two amazing moms in my, in my life, and one's my baby mom. I love that girl. And um, <laughs> one thing about Tasha, you may not know this, uh, but if you happen to come by the Holiday House on a Friday night, um, at any given point, we could be having karaoke night. Uh, yes, we have a karaoke machine. Yes, I can't sing. You should come. It'll be a good time. And um, one of my favorite moments, because it's inevitable, because my, my three-year-old, Tiara, she loves the Frozens. Um, one and two, and we've watched them on repeat for several months. And um, now, thank God we got on. Uh, what's Encanto? So that's the new soundtrack that we're vibing to. So, anyways, I, I love watching my wife and daughter sing Frozen together. Uh, they, they have this moment where they're like, let it go, and then they argue about who gets to be Anna and Elsa. That doesn't have anything to do with the message, just a fun moment in my life. So, let's go to John chapter two. We'll start in verse one, and we'll go down to verse 12. This is in the ESV. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And what we need to know about this, um, again, context, um, weddings are a big deal. Like, they are community events. Remember, they did life in community. Um, And so if this is a huge event, that means some of these places we see in scriptures, like maybe we just jump and think they're big towns, like, like Newport News, and you're like, okay, like I can go through Newport News and meet a new person every day, right? Uh, but in these settings, like everyone knew everyone. And so everybody was coming to the wedding celebration. Maybe some of y'all grew up in places like this, or you've been TDY to places like this, and you're like, oh my God, they got one Walmart. Like, what is going on? Like, <laughs> that town, <laughs> that's where this wedding is taking place. And you also need to know that this is a very high honor shame culture. 
Um, again, that's why the Pharisees, like, we react to them like, oh, they're so religious. But the people were like, no, nah, those, those guys, they got it going on. They look good. Like, so that honor, shame thing is very real. And we need to know this about this narrative because it's going to impact what we see Jesus do. In fact, Jesus would have been very familiar with this honor and shame culture because, like I said, he was conceived out of wedlock. And so his mom is the one that everyone thought was the village dot, dot, dot. And when they would say things about Jesus, like, oh, aren't you the carpenter's son? What they're really saying is like, yeah, this is some, some Maury stuff here. Like, I mean, Jesus, do you know who your daddy is? Are you the carpenter's son? We don't know because we know how it went down. And so what this does is it challenges me, man, at church, because when I look at some other people's situations, I don't know everything that's going on there. I can't just look and be like, oh, well, they made a bad decision, or oh, this happened. Like, No, like, sin is toxic, y'all. Sin breaks us, and it breaks God's heart. That's why he sent his son to pay for it. And so I don't want to judge someone because they don't look like what I think they should look like. Because that may actually be God's will in their life. Like, that may be God working out his glory, revealing who he is in their situation. And so understanding that, let's go to verse 2. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Now, at this point, um, Jesus has not started his public ministry. Um, He's been shoulder tapping. He's invited people to be in a small group. So he doesn't have um, all 12 apostles at this point. He probably has about four of them. And there are some ladies who are following him, too. Um, So all that to say is this is not Jesus and a plus one. Like Jesus was rolling deep. He had his group with him. Verse 3 says, when the wine ran out. So wait a second. Um, Again, remember the context. This is a party. And high honor shame. See, in this culture, a wedding could last a week. And I'm walking a couple through some premarital stuff right now, and they stressed about, you know, a wedding lasting a couple hours. (laughs) So imagine planning for a week-long celebration, and the bridegroom, like, that family would have to fund the entire adventure. So that's all the lodging, all the food, all the beverages, and so this is going to be a big deal. If they were to run out, it means they, they didn't plan adequately and they might not be wealthy enough to actually have this celebration. So this would have been a huge faux pas to run out of wine. It's going to be embarrassing for the entire family and it would bring dishonor. So remember that for later. Uh, the verse continues, the mother of Jesus said to him, she's talking to Jesus, they have no wine. And I love that tone from Mary because it's very matter of fact. Uh, It's like the the clean your room. And um, I shared this earlier about my mom. So she's been with us, what was that, Thursday night. Um, So for the past few nights, we have been fighting over the temperature in my home. Um, (laughs) I think 68 is just the perfect temperature. Uh, My mom disagrees. And um, (laughs) there, there have been times... Where I'm like, okay, we'll crank it up to 70 for you, mom. Like, I want you to be comfortable. It's still cold. And she's just saying it to me. I'm like, it's not cold. Like, science. Like, there's data. Like, I can show you the thermostat. Everyone is walking around, like, in T-shirts and shorts because it's hot in our house. Mom, I'm cold. So after I got out of my feelings um, and, and, you know, kind of prepared for this text, I, I realized that there's something that I think we miss sometimes when we look at God the Son, um, that there's a ministry of sonship, um, that Jesus, we, we get how he points that to the Father. So I only say what I hear the Father saying. I only do what I see the Father doing. So we're like, okay, follow God. But here, Jesus is God. And someone that he created, who happens to be his mom, is very demanding of him. And he takes the time to honor her. So I got out of my feelings and I cranked up the thermostat. So stop judging me. <laughs> They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now pause, Americans. Like, I I get it. Um, (laughs) Calm down, ladies. Like, some of y'all sat up. Like, what do you mean, woman? Like, "Mm." So, like, we we read that text like, woman, I'm trying to sit on the couch and enjoy a beverage and enjoy the game. Like, (laughs) (laughs) but that's why we have to read Scripture in its context. Jesus is actually drawing on the same language that Adam uses when he's presented his bride by God. And he says, woman, uh, this, this is the God. This is the best thing ever. Like, what, how, man, you came up with some stuff. Won't he do it? Like, our God is awesome. 
Like, <laughs> Adam started worshiping. So it, it's a term of reverence. It's a term of endearment. Like in the South or in a military community, this is like the yes, ma'am. And, and so that's how Jesus is addressing his mother. Also interesting is he says, what does this have to do with me? So again, I think we react to that where Jesus is like, hey, mom, just enjoying the party like you are. Like, don't, don't bother me with this trivial stuff. Like, they should have planned better. <laughs> John is helping us out because this was a shift in the relationship of Jesus and Mary. See, what Jesus is saying about what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. He's like, mom, you remember that time when I was 12 years old and I was in the temple. Y'all was looking for me and you were yelling at Joseph like, how'd you lose God? <laughs> you remember that time, mom. When I told you I had to be about my father's business, when I told you this is why I'm here, mom, like, I love you, I'm your boy, but this is what I have to do. This is my purpose. And you asked me to stop. So, mom, if you ask me to do this in front of all these people, we, we don't come back from this, mom. Like, it, it's on and popping. If they see what I can do, there's no turning back. I won't be your little boy no more. And so look what Mary does. Look at this language. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. What we see modeled in Mary there is she demanded the greatness. Jesus, I know what you can do. And I know what this is going to mean to this family. They don't want to bear this shame. We can't allow this to happen. You can fix this. And Jesus is like, mom, if I do this, I won't just be your Jesus anymore. I'll be their Jesus. And Mary in her heart makes the transaction. See, I want to encourage you moms today because there is a moment where you have to do like Elsa and, and, and let it go. And you're going to watch your baby boy or girl do amazing things like Elsa. Just let it go. So that's Jesus turning all the water into wine. Like he's doing his thing, doing this amazing miracle. Mary just demanded and let it go. And I think the greatest job of a mom is to see the greatness in your children. And, and to hold them accountable. Like, that's not what we do here. You're better than that. I, I believe in you. Like, God has an amazing destiny for you. He made you on purpose for a purpose. Proverbs 22, verse 6 tells us, so again, dads, we can do this too. Train up your child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Like, I remember being a kid and hating going to church. Like, I sat there with my arms crossed, and, and I remember all these moments. And I remember, and I didn't say it to my mom because I ain't crazy, um, but I said it in here where she couldn't hear me. <laughs> and I sat there with my arm, arms crossed, and I'm like, I'm never going to church again. I, I cannot wait till I get out of this house, and I will never go to church again. That was a bad plan. It didn't really work out. Um, <laughs> but it kind of proves the verse. <laughs> and, and there's so much to this verse. It means to train a child in the way they should go. Singular, like he. So if you've got multiple kids or if you're leading multiple people, maybe you're a supervisor or, or maybe you're a teacher in a classroom or, or maybe you have some patients or some clients, tailor make that experience to that individual because they're unique. This isn't a cookie cutter thing. It has to be tailored to them. And, and for a parent and child relationship, seeing that destiny, then how do you get there? Well, we know prayer is the secret sauce. Uh, so we're talking like hours, maybe even years of prayer. We're, we're talking about being consistent. We're talking about training, observing, disciplining, like mothering, being a mom to your kids, love your kids. And I think sometimes we make this mistake, like your, your kids, they don't need another friend. Uh, they, they got those. They'll find those. They'll, they'll make new ones. They need a mom. Like they need a dad. They, they need you to embrace the ministry that God's given to you. That's your assignment. So don't sacrifice being their parent to be their friend. Embrace the ministry that you've been given. And we just saw, again, going back to our, our, our text in John, we just saw this relationship change. We just saw a letting go. So she demanded, but she had to let go. It makes me think of um, the psalm that talks about how, like, arrows in the hand of a skilled warrior are children born in your youth. Like, an arrow is a long-range weapon, which means I know that my little kids are going to take out an enemy that I can't reach. And so it's my job as their dad to point them in the right direction, manage the tension between me and their mom, <laughs> And let them go. I, I don't get to adjust the arrow mid-flight. 
I, I don't get to change things. Maybe as you hear that, you're like, well, Riley, what if I took a bad shot? Trust God. You, you, you've done your part. And you could only do what God has graced you to do. So don't sit there comparing yourself to someone else or looking back or regretting it. No, God, I brought the best I had. And, and I, yeah, I was in a tough spot when I raised my kids. And God's like, don't worry, Mary, I got you. Because he's sovereign. And so in your heart, just let it go and continue to pray and trust that God will do only what he can do. And jumping back to our text in John, look at this astounding miracle that took place. Verse 6 says, and there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So again, 20 to 30 gallon jars. These are massive. And, and, I, and I love this symmetry here because the jars, their purpose was for purification. Um, and, and again, a lot of this culture honors shame. Um, it was a lot about looking the right way on the outside. So in order to experience the presence of God, you know, I had to be pure. So I got to purify myself in order to do that. Um, and what Jesus is saying, like, yeah, but in this new covenant, um, I'm actually going to change what's on the inside. Um, this new covenant in my blood, it's going to be different. I am going to make you pure. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel in this story about a classic mom. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine. And did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. So, uh, this is not really my message, but again, we're talking about sidekicks. Look at the servants' obedience here. Because um, like, sometimes God's going to ask you to do some like, wild stuff, like stuff that just doesn't make sense. And this is how Jesus often performed like, miracles of multiplication. Um, like, it's almost like as you take a step of faith, then the miracle happens. Like when he told the disciples to feed the multitudes, the bread multiplied as they gave it out. So imagine being a disciple and you're like, man, I got this little bread. Like here, Nate, just, just a little piece now. Don't be selfish, Nate. I got to feed the rest of them. And then as you break it and give it, it multiplies. So now, the, now that's knowing what Jesus can do. The disciples were that reluctant. Here's some servants who just filled these jars with water. And the text just told us that when they scooped it out, it was still water. So they're like, okay, so you want me to take this guy who's running the show a glass of water? Yes, take it to him. Okay. And so they give him a glass of water. And the verse says, and when he supped, it became wine. What I, what I want you to get is like, y'all, I'm going to be transparent. There are so many times, um, despite study, despite education, despite living a Christian life, there are so many times where I feel that I'm not good enough. And there are times in worship, so I, I know I was making fun of like someone you know, sharing a couple of tears doing worship, but I was right there with you. Like, I, I open my heart and I wait for you, God. Like, like that, that's where I was doing worship because I realized, like, God, all I have is water for these people. Like, I, I am going to get up here with water in my cup, and I'm going to trust that when I pour it out, you'll make it wine. That, that you will do the miracle because our job is just to be faithful with what God has given us. Maybe you're thinking like, God, I'm, I'm giving this child the best I got, but it's just water. God's like, don't worry about it. I'll make it wine. Or, I'm, I'm serving this military unit. I'm serving at this school. I'm doing the best I can. Trust God to do what only God can do. And look at our God. I mean, now we're, do the math. So this is 120 to 180 gallons of wine. This shows us the character of Jesus. It actually makes me think of Ephesians um, chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. So check that verse out. Like, I don't know about you, but I can dream up some stuff. Like, I can come up with some dreams. And I'm like, God, I want to ask you for this. And I'm believing you for that. And God's like, Riley, that's not even a drop in the bucket of what I actually have planned for you. That you haven't even entertained the thought yet. Have you ever just wrestled and submitted that to God? Like, God, I'm, I'm leading this company and you're telling me in your word that I, don't, I haven't even entertained the thought of the best that you have for us? Now, our God does exceedingly more than we could even dream or imagine. He provides and he provides abundantly. And this just shows us that God delights. <laughs> he delights to provide more 
than we can ask or imagine. And then, so that's the quantity, but let's look at the quality. Like, okay, so God, we got a ton of wine, uh, but is this like the bottom shelf stuff? Let's keep reading the text. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, again, the bridegroom is the one funding this party, and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. See, translation, we start with our best. Um, that's why, hey, some of y'all who are, who are single but um, feeling a call towards a relationship and you're dating, um, beware of that first date. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, everyone puts on a, a good first impression. But what we're saying in this text is after their senses are dulled, after you've been wowed by the first impression and, and then the party keeps going, then they start to slip in the cheap stuff. Like, okay, well, let's just keep it going. So, again, that was expensive, but this is a little bit more affordable. That's what everybody does. That's normal. But what Jesus provided, again, scholars contend, but this is the prime wine. Um, this is top shelf stuff, and the master of ceremony immediately could taste the difference. What I love about this miracle is that even in the most difficult of circumstances, I mean, this is, this is a bad situation for this couple, for this family, to run out of wine. Jesus shows up. There was an exchange. There was this exchange with his mom, and Mary knew. She knew what Jesus could do. She, she knew the work of his hands. And so in this moment where things are dire, when we've run out of options, she demands greatness from God. She calls it out of him. That's why I love some of the worship songs we sing. Like, God, that's who you are. I'm, I'm your child. You'll take care of me. I know this doesn't look great. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm going to have to walk through some places that feel super uncomfortable, but I know who you are. I've seen you too many times, Jesus. I've got too many testimonies. Maybe you're here and you, you don't know Jesus, and you're like, what are, what are you talking about? You've heard about him. You've been hearing me share about him. And that is a real God, a real God who wants a relationship with you. So we can be like Mary. Let, let's, let's keep looking at this as, as she demands greatness from Jesus. Then she steps back and allows him to step into his father's plan. Verse 11, this is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And what's the result? And his disciples believed in him. They're like, wait, this guy's different. After that, they went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Such a beautiful picture of the, the grace and the provision of our God. And what I want to do in this moment, men and families, I want to, I want to pray for you. Um, I want to pray for our moms. So would you do me a favor, simply bow your heads. And let's agree and pray together. God, just thank you um, for the example we see from Mary, for the, the courage to sacrifice and the, the consistency, the character to, to keep showing up, to be found faithful, to watch your child suffer. But not only that, God, we see this, this practical action step of demanding greatness, but at the same time releasing. God, I just lift up every mom under the sound of my voice, maybe in the room, maybe watching this online, and, and you're looking back over your life and I just got that. God, I even lift up the moms who, who might not consider themselves a mom. And I don't know your story. I don't know every decision you had to make. I don't know what happened to you. I don't know what you've been going through. But I do know that we can trust our God, that he's a good God. And more than that, he's a, he's a good son, that he understands your circumstances, that he sees what you're going through, and he will always provide for moms. God, I lift up all the moms who are doing it like Mary, who've been doing a great job and, and staying faithful. God, just grace them to, to be able to step into that season of letting go. God, that's not easy. I think Mary still saw Jesus as, as her little baby. I think she still remembered those moments where he was God, but he needed her. He would cry and he, he needed her. I even joke with my mom, like, I'm 36, she still calls me baby. And I'm like, I'm grown. God, embrace the ministry of sonship. So to all those moms, we just want to say thank you. We honor you. God bless you, Miss. 
favor be upon you as you step into that motherly ministry by his grace and for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, do me a favor. Just keep your head bowed another moment for another prayer. Again, when we gather, I don't want to assume that everyone knows Jesus. Uh, maybe this is your moment. See, our God does the miraculous. Yeah, he can turn water to wine. and Yeah, he can have a guy stretch out his hand and part the Red Sea. And yeah, he can make the sun stand still. He, he, that's nothing. That's light. I'm talking about the God who spoke the world into existence. But you know one of the amazing miracles I think we take for granted is the moment that he makes the gospel real to someone. The moment that he reveals himself. To those of us when we're lost, when we're stuck in our own ways, he talks about how he'll leave the 99. These sheep are good. I'm coming after the one. Maybe this is the moment where you sense Jesus coming after you. Scripture teaches us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price that you owe. And in exchange, he offers us a free gift, eternal life, a life with him. So in this moment of privacy and concentration, if that's you, if you're saying, Riley, I, I, I want Jesus, I want that life, I want to start a relationship with him, I have great news for you. The Bible teaches us that all we need to do is pray, that we need to confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that the Father raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So if that's you, would you do me a simple favor and lift your hand where I can see it? Um, just an outward expression of what God's already doing in your heart. And if you're online and you want to make that decision as well, just let us know right there in the comment section or in the chat. Our team is standing by to just come alongside you and help you take your next steps in your journey with Jesus. Anyone else who wants to get in on this prayer, now's your moment. And again, our intent here is never to single anyone out. Uh, we don't want to embarrass you, but what we want to do is we want to pray this prayer together as a church family. So church, would you repeat after me and say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm a sinner, but I confess my sin. I repent. And I choose you. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And today is a new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all. Can we celebrate with anyone who prayed that prayer? Man, God is doing some amazing things. Hey, moms, I want to give you a hand.